I would like to uh, introduce our first keynote speaker. He is part of the leadership of the TU Delft Extension School. He is responsible for the production and delivery of open courseware, Delft X MOOCs, online professional education, and online Master of Science and Master of Science programs. He is also participating in the consortium since 2008. First as an assistant yes, of yes, former yes. president Anka Moder, and since 2013 as board member of the consortium. He also holds a Master of Science in System Engineering, Policy Analysis and Management of Delft University of Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, please welcome Mr. Willem van Wuckenberg from <laughs> Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is awake and ready for this. Uh, for me, it's still early. For you, it's a regular time. Um, and uh, let me put this on this. See something there. There it is. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, a little bit, I think, for a lot of you are not familiar with Delft University of Technology. Um, well, too fast. Clicker is. We'll go like this. So, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, small country in Europe. Uh, and uh, Delft University is, is one of the old universities there, and it's, it's the biggest uh, university of, for engineering, so University of Technology. We have, we're a traditional brick-and-mortar university, uh, so we have a lot of students on campus, one campus, 16 bachelor programs, 30 master programs, uh, in eight faculties, one graduate school, and 24,000 students on one campus, and about five, six thousand staff members or faculty members. Um, here you see an overview of the programs. It's all in science, engineering and design. And uh, some of our programs are, uh, are on top of the, the lists on all the rankings. Um, of course, next to education, we do a lot of research. And the last couple of years, we focused the research in four um, what's called research initiatives. So focused on energy, uh, deltas, infrastructure and mobility, health, and uh, global. And I think uh, what you will see later on in uh, also our online education, that a lot of is aligned with these programs, and a lot is aligned with the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. That's for us uh, an important driver uh, as an... That's something happening here. Um, is an important driver for a university, a public university, to, uh, to contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. For the Netherlands that's important, but also for us uh, as, uh, as university. And so these uh, research initiatives are really uh, contributing to solving societal challenges, as we keep to say them. So that was a little short introduction of, of the to Delft. And then about my talk. Um, we've been doing MOOCs for quite some years and uh, the last couple of months I've been thinking, hey, what's happening uh, around with MOOCs? What, what has been the impact of MOOCs? And um, I'm getting a lot of annoying messages here. You don't see them, but no, go on. Um, so I came up with, go on, I saw this law, 
Amaris, Amaris law. We tend to overestimate the impact of a new technology in the short run, but we underestimate it in the long run. And I think that really applies to MOOCs and, and online education. Um, and I will show you in my keynote um, examples of this in my own university and some of the outside. And um, I hope um, it will help you think about what is the impact of MOOCs. Um, a lot of you are, will not be familiar with Amar's law, but you probably will know this one. Uh, Gardner's hype cycle. And uh, this is actually saying the same thing. Uh, first, you overestimate, it gets a hype, but on the end, you get to the plateau of productivity, and it will really change uh, something and have an impact. And, um, and that's happening with MOOCs. Um, so today I will talk a little bit about our uh, open and online education program, the impact our program has on our university, the long-term impact, and some of the conclusions there. Um, so we started with MOOCs in 2013, and I'm getting really annoyed by this pop-up of the Wi-Fi. Oh, it takes away. Um, we started with, that, uh, with our MOOCs in 2013, and for our university and for our executive board, that was a reason to really see, hey, can we do more with the MOOCs? And that's uh, where I wrote a proposal together with a couple of colleagues for the TU Delft Open and Online Education Program. As I said in the beginning, TU Delft is a traditional brick and mortar university. We're not, we were not in online education uh, at all. And, um, but our, uh, our board recognized that a lot of the trends and things that were happening in education were moving online. So it was important to be there. And our executive boards decided, hey, we don't want to follow. We want to be one of the front runners. That was a strategic decision of them. We helped them to make that decision. Uh, but they also gave us the money to, to start a program. And, um, that was the start of the TU Delft Extension School. Um, the name is, most, for most of you, probably familiar from the US, um, where extension schools have been around for a couple of hundred years uh, at some uh, universities, but there uh, were traditional focus on still classroom teaching. Our extension school is fully online. There is no uh, classroom teaching in our extension school. And, um, for us, it was important to get uh, faculty commitment and uh, an academic leadership. So we got a dean, we call him an e-dean, and a director of education to, to lead the program. I was one of the uh, managers of the Exchange School, and uh, the Exchange School focused on one side on the support of teachers, supporting teachers creating online courses. Most of our teachers have been taught in a classroom, they don't know how to uh, teach online. Uh, most of them have never done an online course, so we really had to help them how to create a an, an high-quality online course. And on the other side, we thought it was important because it was a new field for us, but also in the world, uh, that we have to do uh, research and innovation. So we actually uh, did a lot of activities also in innovation and in research. And we had different uh, courses we developed. Um, for us, it was just setting this, the, the, the university wasn't, was just the big, uh, the exchange school was just the beginning. And um, these were the original goals we had. So it was about educating the world, but also improving the quality of education. And, and that's really important for a traditional research university um, there is always a lot of focus on research and not a lot of attention to education. And these programs helped us to, uh, to uh, get more attention to education and the quality of education. Um, if we look at our... 
Here you see an overview of the MOOCs we developed in the last couple uh, of five years now. And um, we have more than just MOOCs. Um, so first of all, we have OpenCourseWare. Um, we've been doing that since 2007. And that's just publishing the content we use for our campus courses on a uh, public website, ocw.tudelf.nl. And you find all the course materials uh, we use for our campus students online with an open license, and you can reuse them. They are, uh, they're all on both bachelor and master level. There is no uh, interaction with faculty, and you can't get any certificates. Then we had our MOOCs. Those are really complete online courses, but focused on massive numbers of uh, students. So, so there's no individual contact uh, between a teacher and a student, uh, but students do receive feedback, but mostly from each other, from their peers, or the teacher addresses the whole group. Um, when we started, all the MOOCs were on bachelor level. Now we see a much bigger priority. Uh, so we actually have a MOOC that's uh, doing um, uh, teaching uh, students to programming in Scratch for eight-year-old students, is a uh, pupils. And, but we also have a MOOC about um, um, topology of condensed matter, and that's more for PhD uh, students. Uh, so there's much more variety uh, than we tr started with, uh, with our MOOCs. And Then, um, after a while, we saw the MOOCs, but we also got a lot of interest from professionals. And so we developed uh, what we called uh, profets, professional education courses, fully online. And uh, those are paid enrollments, so you only get access to the course when you have paid. Um, there are no, not big numbers of students uh, from, like, 20 to a couple of hundred students in the course, and you get a course certificate and continuous education units that a lot of people need for their uh, professional, uh, professional uh, life. And the last category is the online academic courses. Those are the online variants of existing campus courses. So those are part of a master program, are fully accredited, and you get uh, also accredited course certificates, and it can lead up to a full master degree. We currently don't offer a full master degree, but it can be part of it. Um, for us, it was really important that we used um, all these online activities in our campus courses in a blended way. So in that way, we were developing courses for, for the outside world, but we're actually also changing uh, the university uh, the campus courses uh, as well. And that was a really important uh, combination that, um, that was one of the reasons why our executive board uh, was willing to give us money, uh, because we were also changing the campus education. So if you look at the short-term impact of our program, we have nice numbers. And we have created 88 MOOCs, 35 professional education courses, 25 online courses, about 200 OCW courses, and we have done about 25 blended projects. And we had uh, 2 million enrollments in our MOOCs, uh, 1,800 enrollments in the profits, and we uh, won a couple of awards. And that has been really great for the program, but that's just during running of the program. Uh, it's still important, it really helps, especially the awards really is important for teachers uh, uh, to, to receive awards, so we actively um, uh, have been participating in awards uh, procedures to get awards for our teachers, uh, because that gives them the extra recognition for their extra effort they did in the online courses. Um, I think uh, yeah, two years ago, we reached the uh, one million uh, milestone of enrollments in our MOOCs, and uh, we made a small video there, and I, I, it's still, I thought, interesting to show, although we're now at two million uh, this summer. Uh, it gives you a nice impression of what, what we do within our courses.
Um, what you see in this video is, is also what we want to do on campus, and that's active learning. Uh, we don't want students just to watch a video, but really be active in the course, contribute to the course, and participate and create. Uh, and I, I think, uh, especially uh, also in the engineering and the design, uh, really to, to, to understand that you have to do something. You can't just w uh, listen to a movie. You have to be active and, and um, discuss, uh, create, and, and that's important. And we do that on campus, but we also want to do that online. If we look at our MOOCs, and uh, here you see a an, an, an little overview of the enrollment numbers, what you see is there's a very long tail uh, of courses. So we have a couple of blockbuster courses, uh, especially solar energy uh, is, is really successful. Uh, it's also the biggest run we had. It's now up above 70,000 enrollments. And um, what we see, you have a couple of really popular courses that are, are attracting a lot of the learners. Uh, and then a very long tail with, uh, with uh, MOOCs. Those, the long tail still means at least a thousand enrollments. Um, our average uh, in, in, I think, in 2017 of our MOOCs uh, was about uh, five to six thousand enrollments. That's still a massive number of, of students. Uh, when we started in, in, I think, in 2014, that number was more uh, in, uh, I think, 15,000. So you see the number is going down, and that's because there's much more competition going on. There are many more MOOCs available now to choose. So, um, and that's also, in the beginning we created a lot of MOOCs, and now we're slowing down because what does one extra MOOC contribute to your program? And that's an important question, and that's sometimes very painful for, uh, for, for, uh, for professors to say, yeah, but, your, your, uh, your MOOC is interesting, but we're not going to make it. You're not getting funding from us because it doesn't contribute uh, to our program. And there are already three similar MOOCs uh, with the same topic. So why should we invest in your MOOC? And that's not an easy discussion um, because they all think they're unique and they're the best and all things like that. Um, I see a lot of smiles there. <laughs> People recognize that. Um, so, uh, what we've seen is that if you're the first uh, MOOC on a certain topic, um, that, that, that's crucial. Uh, if that can mean you, you can pick the whole topic and, and uh, you will also, if you're doing a good job, will, uh, a lot of other universities will not publish their MOOC on that topic. So, we've seen that with solar energy. It was our first MOOC we introduced in 2013, and still, I think, uh, only, there are only a couple of other MOOCs on solar energy. And we introduced our MicroMaster programs on solar energy, and we're still getting a lot of enrollments in our, uh, in our solar energy program. Um, and everyone is saying, you know, Delft is leading that topic. And that's um, not just important for our education, but even more important for our research. So our professors are asked all around the world to participate in project because he is the solar energy MOOC king. Um, we're going to the long-term impact. What I see, I, I recognize five different impacts. Uh, so from courses to programs to credits, from a national to a global world of education, from initial education to continuous education, from a traditional lecture room to blended learning, and towards open education. I will go through them uh, this morning. Is it possible to get some water up here? Some water? Thank you. Um, so, from courses to programs to credits. So when we started, we had those MOOCs. 
And um, it will, we used a tender system, so any uh, teacher, professor could propose, uh, could submit a proposal to make a MOOC. And uh, if we thought it was interesting enough and he had a good proposal, a good uh, course team, he, he received funding uh, to, uh, to make the MOOC. He received our support. He could use the studio facilities. Um, so that was interesting for him. And we were, we are the gatekeeper to uh, publishing a MOOC on the edX platform where we publish all our MOOCs. Um, what we started to, to, to notice, hey, we see some trends in, in, in these courses. So we started to, what we created, portfolio themes. And these are the themes we defined. Uh, aerospace engineering, affordable and clean energy, responsible leadership of technology, data analysis and programming, design and architecture, and so on. And um, actually, when we looked at it, and here's your graphical, is that some of those topics really aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And that's, as I said in the beginning, important for our university. So the affordable and clean energy is a big part of our uh, uh, initiatives, and that aligns with the UN Sustainable Goal number seven. And uh, same with sustainable cities, is aligned with number 11 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so we're really making visible that we are contributing to the uh, UN goals and it really helped to recognize our, uh, our courses and actually nowadays when a teacher wants to do a MOOC we have to, they have to show how they are contributing to one of these themes. So they can't do a, a, a course that is outside one of those, they have to contribute to one of those themes. And the next thing what we did is we start to organize our MOOCs in what we call short learning programs. And uh, we've uh, followed the initiatives of edX on this, uh, this site. So first they started with the X series. And those were uh, a couple of courses, at least three, uh, understanding specific topic through a series of courses. It was very loosely connected. Uh, there was not much of an integration, uh, it's just three courses that are on the same topic and not uh, too much uh, uh, doubling. And then uh, we had the professional certificate programs. I think those are really the, the interesting ones. Uh, those are really uh, focusing on professionals. Uh, what is there in there for them to, to, uh, to gain uh, skill or knowledge? about a specific uh, topic in their field. Uh, there has to be at least two courses. Um, and um, actually, they're our most successful programs we have. And then the last one is the MicroMaster program. Uh, it's something that edX introduced, I think, two years ago. Uh, MIT uh, at first one on uh, supply chain management. And uh, we introduced a, a micro master program on solar energy engineering. And the interesting aspect of a micro master that makes it also complex and difficult is that on one side it is an, an, uh, an product on itself for a professional. On the other side, if you uh, pass the micro master and you get admitted to, an, uh, to the master program at, at the line switch, you get a waiver for the courses you participated in. Um, and that makes it difficult because, uh, at least for our university, all our masters are research masters. And, but professionals are not really looking for uh, another uh, a research master. Most of them already done that. Uh, so that makes it a little bit difficult uh, program, and especially because it has to be uh, uh, what we call 15 uh, European credit systems, and that's a quite heavy uh, program. Um, so that means uh, the, the study load per week had to be really high for th those courses. And all our data showed we shouldn't do that, uh, but uh, we wanted to, to see how this experiment works. And actually, the courses are really popular. A lot of enrollments we have in those courses, uh, but there are not a lot of uh, students that uh, complete the program. 
And I think that you see that uh, on almost all the MicroMaster programs that are, at least in the European MicroMaster programs, I have to say that. Um, so here you see an overview of our uh, professional certificate programs, MicroMaster and X-Series. Um, if you look at our professional certificate programs, uh, one we actually was original started as an X series was the data analysis and visualization with the Excel. Uh, together with a university in Argentina, we translated that program to Spanish uh, to make it available also in the Spanish world. And um, actually, one of the latest programs we added was electrical cars, and that's uh, our most successful uh, professional certificate program that's uh, really uh, attracting a lot of people, and uh, also with very high numbers of people that want a certificate, and that's uh, making some money for the uh, university. And the last, la latest one we uh, introduced, it introduced like two weeks ago, is the leaderships, leadership essentials for engineer. Um, so if you look, at the credits we give, uh, we have the uh, continuous education units. Those are credits for professionals in a lot of fields uh, that they use those. We have the micromaster. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, that is when you pass the micromaster, get admitted to the to uh, the master program, you will uh, get a waiver for those courses. So you don't get direct. Uh, credits for it, but it leads to credits. And then we have actually uh, what we call a credits for MOOCs programs. And um, that is really uh, giving credits to MOOCs for our, our own students. And uh, the idea we had is, hey, there are so many MOOCs out there, um, isn't possible for our own students to, give cre to, to get credit for our MOOCs. Um, because that can enrich their portfolio, can enrich their, co their, their, their programs, and um, can we cooperate with other universities on, on this topic? Um, so the whole concept is based on trust. Uh, so if you give credit to your own students for a specific MOOC, then the other universities will do the same thing without checking that uh, separately. Uh, we do, uh, because we're all uh, universities that have to deal with exam committees, uh, w for all the MOOCs we have an additional exam that's happening on the campus where the student is. Um, and we're doing that with these universities. Uh, we started out with uh, a couple of universities on the edX platform. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, Adelaide, uh, uh, the Australian National University, and um, um, AP APFL, Rice University. That's where we started, and now we broaden it and also got another uh, European uh, universities around. And um, it's really interesting to see because um, we have universities that are all different uh, educational systems. And that usually makes it al already almost impossible to uh, cooperate because uh, your uh, academic calendar is not aligned, uh, rules and regulations are completely different. And um, um, my colleagues put in a lot of effort to get this working, and it is actually working. So a lot of our students are doing now a course on astrophysics at uh, Australian National University, for example. We don't offer that course ourselves, so now they can do that course online. And, and the other way around, uh, so uh, it is getting more and more popular for our students. Um, currently, it is only for what we call uh, elective courses. So it's not part of the core curriculum of the, of the program because that's too sensitive for a lot of uh, committees in the university. So we started out on the outside, the outskirts, or honors program, elective courses, and then uh, we're slowly moving in. They don't know that yet, but we'll get there. So traditional education has been a national market at least in Europe, although we have the European uh, uh, Union, um, 
within the European Union, it's still a national, uh, national uh, uh, rules and regulations for education. And what we see with the MOOCs that the internationalization of education uh, speeded up. Um, if I look at our own universities, you see that in our bachelor program, 7% is international, mostly Belgium students, um, because most of the programs are in Dutch. In our master programs, already uh, one third is uh, international. In our PhD programs, two thirds is international. In our online paid education, it's 75%. And in our, in our MOOCs, it's 97% is international. Only 3% of our MOOC learners are Dutch. Um, and we see those numbers going up, more and more international students. And actually, a lot of um, MOOC participants apply to, jo to, to uh, do a master program at our university. Last year, it was about 12% of, uh, of our international um, um, master students uh, did first participated in a MOOC before they applied uh, to our program. Uh, so it's actually, the MOOCs are generating a lot of traffic to our campus. And that's good, it means we can select uh, the best students. And we have some data about what they've done in, in, in the MOOCs. Um, we also see that our MOOCs are used in other classes around the world. Um, uh, so here are some examples, but, uh, and that's important for us. All our MOOCs are shared with an open license. So any university can, uh, can use the content of our MOOCs uh, and use it in their, their classes. And a lot of them have do done that. Here are some examples, but there are many more. And uh, some uh, tell us, and, and, and uh, some even want to pay us for, uh, for, for it. And that's always good, but uh, we do allow you to, to use our content for free uh, because uh, we think it's important to share our content and, and the content is already paid for by the, by, uh, the, the government. We are a state, uh, uh, we are, we're a public university, so it's already paid for, so we should share our content. And um, what you see is that... Um, we get a lot of feedback back from those uh, schools that are using our content. And actually, that helps us to improve our courses, to make them better. And, and so, in that way, it also leads to better quality of, of our courses. So, the next trend I see is from initial education to continuous education. Um, when we started out with MOOCs, uh, there was the idea of a uh, democrat, uh, how do you say it, uh, educating the world, and, and everyone could access them. But if you look at the MOOC data and see who is doing the MOOCs, it's actually typically, and an on average, about a 28, 29 year old uh, uh, professional that already done an, uh, a master and or an, a bachelor program. So they already received education. Um, that was not originally the fault we had when we started with MOOCs, but that's what's happening. And that's also what we've seen interest of companies in, that they, a lot of companies are saying, yeah, our young employees, they want to do MOOCs for uh, their continuous uh, education. Uh, and they say, yeah, well, we don't know how to do that. Uh, so can you help with that? And uh, so actually, we have created quite some courses together with companies. Um, and some are available as a MOOC. Uh, so they actually paid for the development. And uh, we can offer the MOOCs on that X platform. And uh, their, their, uh, their own staff uh, can uh, participate in the MOOCs for free. Uh, some uh, created a MOOC and then we created like a blended course for them uh, on, uh, uh, in their uh, company. And they're all different kinds of models we've done with them. And they are seeing that this is the way forward. And um, it saves a lot of travel time for uh, their staff. Uh, and um, a lot of their young 
uh, employees get re really enthusiastic about this, and a lot of them have already experience with uh, creating a MOOC. This is for us uh, a really interesting cooperation because uh, traditional we have a lot of uh, collaboration with uh, with industry uh, for research, not a lot with education. Uh, our student, our alumni, will go to all those companies, but they traditionally don't come back to us uh, for uh, continuous education. And now we have a way to continue to help our alumni and uh, to, to uh, continue to educate, to really be the lifelong learner that they're supposed to be. And um, uh, we're now in discussion with like the, the big Dutch companies like uh, Shell, uh, Unilever, uh, but also with uh, international companies, Deloitte, um, and McKinsey. Uh, those are all uh, companies we're working and developing courses together with. And actually, we, re uh, we had a couple of alumni that came to us. We want to make a course about leadership for engineers. All right, we can talk about that. We have a professor that's interested in, uh, who's doing uh, courses on that. Can we work together? And, and actually, so alumni are helping us create those courses, making them the best we can, but also making sure they align what, what the, the, the professionals need because that's not something we are traditionally are very good at as a, as an, as a university. Uh, we know how to educate our 18-year-old pupils, but really about how to create a course for professionals is not something that we are really an expert in. I'm losing my mouse, here it is. Then going to to the campus. Um, I think this, kind of, this image is familiar for a lot of you. Um, you see a traditional classroom uh, with a big hole like we have here and everyone with his laptop on his knees. Um, and I think that's not the best way to teach. Um, and our university is set in our uh, what we call vision on education um, that we want to go to a mix of online and on-campus education uh, because that's got the benefits of both of them. Uh, you can, can do a lot of teaching much better online, uh, but you need uh, the campus interaction, interaction between students with teachers, and, and that continues to be important. Um, but the, the room I showed here is not the best room to do that. Um, th th this room doesn't lead to a lot of interaction. Uh, so actually what we started to do is, is de 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 develop uh, what we call what kind of activities want, do we want to do in classrooms and what kind of classrooms do we need for that. And uh, here you see some examples. So we have uh, just frontal teaching a mixed practice, collaboration, testing, as some of the examples, and then you lead up, yeah, how big should those rooms be? And uh, we developed what we call an, an, uh, a cookbook for educational spaces. So every time uh, we are um, uh, developing new uh, classrooms or refitting uh, existing classroom, we'll follow this, uh, this cookbook in how to optimize these rooms for blended learning. Uh, so actually, uh, in, in a couple of weeks, we're opening a new building, and it only has rooms that are suitable for blended learning. That's our older rooms, because we have enough of those big hall rooms. We need rooms for blended learning. And that's really, you see, how this development of online education is really changing what's happening on campus. Um, because we are not really yet familiar with all the, all the aspects of blended learning, we actually are doing a European-funded project with six universities on um, what we call European maturity model for blended learning. Um, so can we now say how far a university or a course 
is aligned with uh, for uh, is, is suitable for uh, for blended learning. We're doing that on three levels: on course level, so how is your course designed? Uh, on strategic uh, level, so how uh, how are the procedures in your university? How are the educational spaces? Uh, how's the support arranged? And then on a governmental uh, policy, uh, what governmental rules are there? Um, in some uh, countries. Uh, teachers are getting paid on the amount of uh, hours they spend in a classroom. If you start with blended learning, uh, it, it will cut their income. Uh, so they don't like that. Th that that is, is an example of uh, what has to be changed. So we're currently in development of this, uh, this project. Um, it started last year and will continue for, for another two years. We're doing that with uh, KU Leuven, uh, with the University of Edinburgh, the um, Univers uh, City University of Dublin, and uh, Aarhus University, and a Finnish university, I always forget the name of, uh, Tampere University of Applied Science. And it's coordinated with the European Association of Distance and Teaching Universities. Um, so, and then the last trend, and that's towards open education. Um, a little bit back for people who are not familiar with open education. Um, this is a uh, nice definition. I'm going. I think what's really important with open education is 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 that open doesn't it, it is not just free. What we've seen in a lot of MOOCs, they're free for participants to enroll, but that's not really open education. Open education means it's free plus permissions to reuse it. Um, and those permissions are, are these. So you're allowed to retain it, reuse it, revise it, remix it, and redistribute it. Um, and a lot of online platforms are prohibiting this kind of, uh, of reuse. And um, Beginning of this year, our university presented our new uh, strategic framework, and openness is actually one of the core principles in our uh, strategic framework. And um, what we've been working on for many years, and now it is officially in the policy of the university, is that open education, but also open science, open access, is really important for the strategy of the university. Uh, it's one of the drivers of our university, and I'm really proud that my university is, is putting this uh, 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 so prominent in our uh, strategy. And one of the things, examples I, I think of open education is what we see in the localization of MOOCs. And that's uh, because the, core, uh, the MOOCs are open, and we publish them all also with an open li license, so anyone can reuse them, is that what we see is that uh, other institute initiatives are starting to use our MOOCs and are translating, localizing the MOOCs uh, for our own country. So here's some ex examples. Uh, in uh, Kinok is in Vietnam. Uh, Asuka uh, Academy is in Japan. Uh, Atrak is uh, in Jordan, and Xaitang X is in China. And um, they're all using our MOOC and are um, localizing them uh, to, to, uh, to fit their needs. So I've got an example here at the Kinok uh, platform. Uh, it's a Vietnamese nonprofit organization. Um, it's just a couple of young Vietnamese people with a passion for education. It really was fun talking with them. And uh, they want to make world-class education ac accessible for Vietnamese, because a lot of Vietnamese don't speak uh, English. And uh, so they selected a couple of our MOOCs, and uh, the translation was done with crowdsourcing, with the help of hundreds of volunteers. And I think that's a really strong model, how you can use open education to improve education in your country, in your language. And um, that's also where the Open Education Consortium is facilitating and helping a lot of institutes around the world. Uh, currently, we have about 240 members from 44 countries in 29 languages. 
uh, working together and sharing their expertise and their knowledge and helping each other in uh, moving open education forward. And I'm vice president of the board, so that I have to say that, of course. Um, so going to the conclusions, I, I thought, uh, uh, yesterday we visited uh, the floating market, and I, I thought uh, hey, it, it, um, this image uh, gives a good illustration. It looks like chaos, but actually uh, quite a, it's all moving in the same direction, and it doesn't happen, uh, there, not a lot of accidents happen, it's, it's actually more organized than you think, and I think that's also the world of of MOOCs. Um, you, it looks like a chaos when you start looking at it, but I start to see trends, and, and I illustrated those trends here uh, today. So these are the trends I, I see. And when I get back to Amar's law, I think we see that we overestimate the impact of a new technology in the short run, but underestimate it in the long run. So MOOCs might disappear, but they have had a very big effect on universities, at least on my university, and I see that more broadly around the world. So, thank you very much. And I, we have a couple of minutes for questions, I think. So. If you have any questions, we have the microphone provided for you. And uh, please, <laughs> maybe it's too early to ask questions. Uh, yes, we have. Over there, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much for this very illuminating uh, talk. Uh, I have two questions. Number one is, what is the male-female ratio of the instructors or course developers? And secondly, when we, do, when we have collaboration with you, what is the cost implied? How much would you charge us if we would be your partner? Or would it be free? Thank you very much. Um, so first, the gender. Um, so. Um uh, traditionally, our university is engineering school, so that means traditionally we have mostly male faculty. Um, we try to have in all the course teams also some females around, uh, because we think that it is important. Uh, so like one of example, one of our first MOOCs we did on water management, there were two professors but actually we added two uh, associate uh, professors to it that are two females, so we had a more balanced uh, course team. Um, not in all courses that is possible, I must say. Uh, if I look at my support team, it's most females. Um, um, but uh, yeah, that's happened to me. I try to select the best people I can get, and uh, that happened to be females, and I don't know why, but uh, I'm very happy with them, uh, they supported the teachers and that helps. Um, the second question, if, uh, if you want to partner with us, it depends on the partnership, what you want to do. Uh, so a lot of our content is free to use, it's uh, open license, you can do, uh, use it with any cost. Um, but uh, the, we also have different other models depending on what kind of collaboration you're looking for. So we can discuss that. I see a question there. Yes, good morning. Thank you for your comments. I uh, have a question about working with for-profit educational organizations. Do you have a particular policy about doing so or not doing so? Um, that's an interesting question. So when um, we uh, were thinking about uh, joining a MOOC platform, uh, we had a lot of discussions about what platform to join. Uh, we had offers from both Coursera and edX, and, um, and what for us was the final, this, uh, what made for us the, the, the most important thing was that edX was a uh, non-for-profit, uh, and is more, um, we as a university have much more influence 
in what's happening in, in the edX consortium than if you go for for profit. Uh, so um, we tend to have more interest in non-profits, but of course, as a university, we work with a lot of different organizations. Um, I think the most important is what's your mission of, your, of, the, of the organization you're working with, and, and does it align with the missions we have as a university and our values? My question is about uh, open license and localization. It's working. Right. Uh, so in my understanding, open licensing means that anybody can repurpose your course as well. If that's the case, how do you monitor that your course content is actually um, true to the original content, um, maybe it's not so much related to science, but in social science, each country has different political climate, and sometimes when you translate something, uh, meaning gets lost in the translation. So how do you monitor that the content that you produce is properly localized in different countries? Um, so we've had different models to do that. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's an open license, so anyone can use it uh, without us telling us uh, about it, and that's, th that's fine with us. There are some institutes that come to us and want to uh, reuse uh, our content, and um, uh, a couple of times, we've done that with ad uh, people in the Arabic world, we actually, uh, what we uh, use in, in a surrogate professor. Uh, so we actually got, um, th this case, it was an, a former PhD student, uh, who's, who uh, got his PhD from Delft, and he was teaching at an Arabic uh, university, and he was actually um, uh, like teaching that uh, that MOOC and creating extra content to uh, not only translate it but really localize it uh, to the situation in, in, in the Arabic world. And uh, what's interesting, we got a lot of feedback from that and used that to improve our original MOOC to make it more uh, w w a broader perspective. Because traditional, of course, our perspective is the Western world. We try to be more open, but not everything we know. Uh, so uh, that really helps that input from those countries uh, to, to make our courses better. No more question. Oh, we have one question. Ah, there. Yeah. Uh, just wondering about the situation of the uh, education system in uh, your country. Uh, seems like MOOC is the way to go. But just wondering about the, uh, some other universities where uh, they are not adapted to using MOOC. Uh, how are they performing right now? Just. Uh, could you please give us some overview? Thank you very much. Um, so, when we started with our MOOCs, um, we got a couple of enthusiastic teachers, young teachers that thought, hey, online, that's interesting. And we got them uh, to participate to create the first MOOCs. And that created so much enthusiasm that uh, others w wanted to follow. And uh, it also generated so much attention um, that our government got interested. Hey, what's happening here? And they got to talk with us, and they tried to change the rules so that uh, we could do what we wanted to do. Uh, a couple of times we were doing things that were against the law, and, uh, but our Ministry of Education said, you're allowed to do that because it's an uh, interesting experiment. Um, that was the benefit of being the first, and actually they changed some of the rules and regulations, and now actually the government is doing, uh, has a, a grant program uh, for, do, for online education. Um, and that was because we just did it, and, and, and 
didn't, uh, we, we asked for permission afterwards, and, and that sometimes is needed. Thank you very much. Okay, I think that's the, that's wraps up your uh, interesting talk about the long run impact of MOOC by Professor William Van, Van Kenburg, the Vice President of the Board, Delft University of Technology, Open Education Consortium, the Netherlands. I also really like uh, the statement, uh, which is very inspiring. We educate the world by sharing knowledge, connecting people from around the world. This is very nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. Thank you.